which would be pertinent. The benefits for you as landholders will extend beyond keeping the soil that you paid for, which, you know, you only own the to top 12 inches, you might as well keep it on your property, um, but also to the health of your livestock and beyond that to the productivity. So please put your hands together for Mishko. Thanks, Kim. Can you hear me right up the back? Now? Can you hear me now? Great. So to change thing up a bit for the last presentation of the day, as Kim said, my name's Mishko and I'm a civil and environmental engineer and I specialise in fluvial geomorphology. And those of you who don't know, fluvial geomorphology is how rivers change their shape and form in the landscape. And then I help um, groups like reef catchments and other NRM groups manage these processes. So a bit of a plan for today's talk. I'm going to talk about some of the impacts of stream erosion. Why does stream erosion occur? And throughout the presentation, I'll show different examples of stream erosion. Then towards the end, I'll talk about some of the ways we can choose to manage stream erosion, reduce rates of erosion. So to kick off, some of the impacts of stream erosion. So this is a pretty drastic example of the impacts of stream erosion. It's down in Victoria, in the Gippsland region, where I used to work. I started my career. It's moving up into southeast Queensland. This is in the Lockyer Valley. This is actually the previous speaker just talking with John at lunchtime. This is just downstream of his property. John, unfortunately, um, has the claim of probably having one of the worst um, stream bank erosion issues I've seen for no fault of his own. Um, just upstream of here, it was devastated in both the 2011 and 2013 floods. The Brisbane River. I don't know if you can see it there. There's some actual people standing up there. So that's almost a 20 metre high bank. So when you're looking at the impacts, it's going to be devastating for farming communities and farmlands. A few years ago, after Cyclone Oswald, I think it was, the one in 2013, a Canadian astronaut was in the International Space Centre. And as he was flying up the Queensland coast, he took a number of these photos. So over the Fitzroy River in Rockhampton, you can see just huge volumes of fine sediment being exported out to the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. Further south, the Mary River near Gympie. And the Kalipo River. And the Burnett River as well. So the same process was occurring up all these rivers, huge volumes of sediment being exported out, which is a huge management issue for groups like reef catchments and other NRM, M, NRM groups up the coast. Also has a huge impact on our water supplies. So this is Mount Crosby Treatment Plant, the main water supply for South East Queensland. During the 2013 flood event, Brisbane came within hours of having its whole water supply being cut off because they were just pumping almost pure mud out of the Brisbane River. And you can see it here. They couldn't just treat it. It was just so full of mud and silt that it couldn't be treated quick enough. Again, John, I think this is in Mount Sylvia Valley. You might recognise this photo. This is Mount Sylvia Road, the valley that goes up through the, um, the valley that John lives in, in the Upper Lockyer Valley had about nine or so creek crossings that were all washed out in 2011 and then worse erosion in 2013 still. So impacts on transport as well, it's huge. More locally, you're all quite aware that you had some pretty major flood events last year associated with Cyclone Debbie. Some of the um, once in a generation size floods in some areas. So I did some work with reef catchments, sort of a rapid assessment of the catchment after Cyclone Debbie trying to see what conditions the rivers were in and, what, and stream banks in particular. Generally, most of the streams in the reef are actually in a pretty good condition. They had really good sort of bank resistance. An example here is the Proserpine River. But there are a whole range of examples we found across the region where there was sort of accelerated rates of stream bank erosion occurring. One of the worst examples was Oakey Creek uh, near Eden in the Sandy Creek catchment just south of Mackay bank erosion which has actually taken out this road you can see so there is almost been washed out completely and there's a photo of it so that's where the road used to head off into the creek so stream bank erosion has basically destroyed that road further south west hill creek 
rapid rates of meander migration and streambank erosion impacting on sugarcane production. And Cherry Tree Creek as well, which is in Rocky Dam Creek catchment, so similar processes. So that's some of the impacts of stream erosion, but why does it occur? So I firstly want to say that streambank erosion is a natural process, so you quite often see meandering streams which sort of have erosion on the outside bend and deposition on the inside bend. Here's a really good example of a meandering stream and stream in old channels from hundreds or thousands of years ago. So it's a natural process and it's been happening for thousands of years and it will continue to happen for thousands of years. But there's things that we as a society have done that have increased the rates of channel erosion. And a really important concept to understand is when you're standing on your stream bank and you're seeing erosion, it might not be caused by local things within that reach. They can be caused by factors well upstream and well downstream of the property as well. I'll show you some of them shortly. So things that happen here or here can affect what happened further downstream. And one of the common causes of the stream bank erosion we're seeing across um, eastern Australia is things that have happened well away from the local site. Don't know if any of you have seen this diagram before, but this was made by an engineer by the name of Lane in the 1950s from America. And it's a bit of a simplification of the processes that impact on stream erosion, but it's a really good tool that I use in my job almost every week um, to help me explain what's going on in the creek, but also to help communicate to others what's happening as well. And Lane came up with what this balance, which is called Lane's balance, and it basically says that a stream is in balance with these four primary factors. So the stream slope, so that's the gradient of the stream, how steep it is, how much flow comes down the stream, down the stream. So how big are the flood events, how regular are the flood events, how long do the flood events occur for, it's all tied up in this metric here. How much sediment is being transported by the river, so that's the sands and the gravels and the cobbles, it gets transported by the river downstream. If a river is transporting sands and gravels and cobbles, it's actually using energy to do that. And that's energy that then is not available to erode the bed and banks of the channel. Then the resistance of the bed and banks. And the resistance can be provided by the size of the sediment. So a sand bank has a lot less resistance than a, a cobble or gravel bank because they're larger sediment sizes. But resistance can also be supplied by the vegetation that holds the bank together. And we'll talk a bit about that later today. So if you're looking at this balance, if there's a stable stream system, there might be a little bit of erosion here and deposition there, you'd say the stream is it's in balance. But when there's a, a sudden change in one of these factors, the stream can be tipped out of balance. And it can either be tipped into an erosional phase, where the bed and banks start to erode and you get deepening and widening, or a sedimentation phase, where it might start filling up with sands and cobbles and gravels. And if you're looking at the balance again, I like to think of this side, the magnitude of the, 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 the multiple of the slope times by the flow is how much energy is available in the creek. And that energy is used to transport the sediment that's coming down the reach and also to overcome the resistance of the bed and the banks. I'm going to now show a range of examples where one of these factors have been changed and we'll see how the streams or rivers and examples respond. Firstly, stream flow. One of the most famous examples in Australia of how stream flow has affected the geomorphology or the shape or form of the river is the Snowy Mountain Scheme. <clears throat> Many of you would know what happened in the Snowy Mountain Scheme. They basically made a dam at the top of the Snowy River, near Jindabyne, and they sent water inland into the Murray-Darling Basin catchment. That resulted in a lot less flow coming down the Snowy River and then a lot more flow being down the Tumut River which is into the Murray-Darling system. So down here is an example of the Snowy River, a photo of the Snowy River in the early 20th century. So you see a big wide river roughly in this similar spot. And there's this photo here is what it looks like now. So all that flow that used to come down the river no longer goes down the river because it goes down through the Murray-Darling system, but still getting all this sediment supply from the hills and the gullies. So you're starting to fill up and the creek is actually narrowing. So if you're thinking of the balance, I'll go back to the balance. How does 
real reduction in stream flow. Everything else has roughly stayed the same, so it's gone into a sedimentation phase. And you're starting to see the valley fill up with gravel. On the other side of the valley, of the range, going into the Tumut River, where it's had a large increase in stream flow. All that water that used to go down the snow is now being pumped through the hydroelectric system down the Tumut River for irrigation. You're seeing wild scale channel change. A massive erosion. So if you again, you go back to the balance, it's got a lot more energy and it's tipped it into an erosional phase. Stream slope. This is an example out in the Bowen Basin. So most of the mines in the Bowen Basin now have really good protocols around how they manage waterways around their mine systems, but this was taken about 15 years ago before some of these systems have been developed. And here's an open cut coal mine. And you can see an old stream path going roughly through here. They wanted to access the coal under the stream, so they've had to create a stream diversion. And you can see the new river system's been cut through there. So it's taken a really sinuous, windy river, and put it down a straight path and drastically increased the slope. And you've seen large scale channel erosion through here as a result of that steepening up of the slope. Got a little video that sort of simulates that process. So this is a flume study, which is basically a, a flume where they simulate both flow and sediment going through a system. I think. Uh, touch. Yeah, here we go. So you can see you've got a constant source of um, flow and sediment coming down the flume. And they're going to simulate that. Channel upstream of that. start to see water and sediment go up faster and upstream of the cutoff, you're starting to see the banks yep. collapse in due to that steepening. We go back to the balance, tipping it into an erosional phase. goes on but you get, the, you get the impression here it just keeps eroding, it gets wider, start to get those meanders coming back and it starts to try and form the sinuous shape that it originally had. So over time that's what rivers do. You tip them out of balance by straightening them or another process, over time they'll try and adjust their form to replicate what they originally had. You can still really see it here. <coughs> Sand and gravel extraction. Many of our rivers have been reused as a resource for sand and gravel to support um, urbanisation, building, cement. One of the worst examples is uh, the Mary River down in southeast Queensland. And this is in Kenilworth, just um, sort of in the Sunshine Coast hinterland, not far from Noosa. Heavy, heavily sand and gravel extraction industry in the sort of 1980s to support the development of the Sunshine Coast. And if you... Th oh, wait. Similar sort of study, we're going to simulate now digging out some gravel from the channel. So if you think about the balance, what we're doing here is we're effectively steepening it up. So you dig a big hole, you're actually steeping that zone, and you see widespread erosion propagating upstream of that hole. And also, all the hole then fills up with sediment. So that sediment is no longer being supplied to the downstream reach. 
So now it has the energy to transport the sediment. The sediment's now filling up the hole, so it then uses that energy to erode the bed and banks, the channel downstream. You're seeing that happening both downstream of the hole and erosion upstream of the hole as well. Now it's going to simulate a floodplain mine. It's quite often you extract sand and gravel from the floodplain. Can be done safely, but if you get too close to the channel, again, it's steepening up the slope, and it's called what's called the pit gets captured. And again, you see widespread um, erosion heading upstream of that. Pretty graphic example of the impacts of sand and gravel extraction is um, again in the Lockyer Valley. Rubbera Creek, which on the other side of your place, John. 2002, you can see a pretty massive quarry in the middle of the river channel. This was during the big drought, so they assumed it probably wasn't going to flow for a while. So you can see a little creek, Rubbera Creek, upstream of the pit. Extraction, extraction. 2010, we all know the drought broke. We had massive rainfall events and flood events. And then you can see what the channel now looks like upstream of the quarry pit. So pretty narrow channel back in 2002. 2012 after the massive flood event um, in the Lockyer Valley, the channel's now hundreds of metres wide. Again, back to the balance, digging a big hole, steepening up the grade, and then you get this response of channel erosion upstream. So most of the examples I've been showing you have been about what happens when you tip the balance into an erosional phase. But also, changes in sediment supply and increases in sediment supply can make channels fill up with sediment. And a classic example, I was doing an aerial assessment of the Fitzroy River catchment uh, just the other week. And there's widespread gully erosion in the Fitzroy River catchment. Here's a pretty graphic example of a major gullying system. And there's a lot of fine sediments in that that get washed straight out of the reef. There's also a lot of sands in there too. And if you now were flying over the Isaac River, it's almost completely filled up with sand. So all the pools that used to sport fish and used for pumping and whatnot are now just completely, it's just a sand landscape. But almost just, yeah, unrecognisable as a river almost. It was just all those downstream, it's still in really good nick. It's got lots of nice pools and habitat features for fish. But this sand is just propagating its way down the system. It is it's moving down, yeah. Yeah, so what's called a sand slug, and it literally marches down the system over every flood. It will move a little bit further down, a little bit further down. Bank resistance. Um, it's a really important part of the balance. And as I said, it can be created by a range of things, so rock, concrete. They can all be forms of bank resistance, but the best form of bank resistance is native vegetation. Here's an example just not too far from here. It's Bagley Creek, really good um, riparian vegetation. We like to call this geomorphically effective vegetation. It's structurally and age class diverse. So it's not just a grass, it's not just a tree. It's a range of those structural features. So you've got the ground covers, you've got the shrubs, and you've got the larger trees. And you need all of them to be really good bank resistance. If it's just grass, quite often it always starts to think of grass is only as strong as its weakest link. Quite often see it gets a little patch where there's no grass and it'll get in and get under it. If it's just trees with no grass, you quite often see scour around the tree. Uh, so it's those combination of those structural elements that provide really good bank resistance. Crazy. And why does it cause um, really good bank resistance? So scour. Scour is the erosional mechanism when fast flowing water starts to mobilise the sediment. Vegetation uh, provides hydraulic resistance. So as it flows, starts flowing through the vegetation. In this example, it has to use its energy to overcome the branches, the leaves, the foliages. It doesn't then have that energy to erode sediment. And effectively slows the water down in that near bank zone. So you have really slow water up against the vegetation and then the faster water will be in the centre of the channel. The other mechanism is the grasses and ground covers, they actually form a physical barrier. So they lay down and they shield the sediment from moving. So 
So that's how it impacts on the sort of the scour process. The other important one is mass failure or bank collapse or slumping. Really steep banks are actually prone to failure from a geotechnical problem just for their, their height and their steepness. And you get what's called these failure surfaces. And that's how the bank slumps. The way I like to think about it is a bit like reinforcement in concrete. So concrete's actually really, really strong in compression. If you push it together, it's really strong. But if you pull it in tensile, it's really weak. And that's why they put sort of steel reinforcement in concrete to support buildings and bridges and things like that. It's very similar to sediment in banks. You can push it together and it's really strong, but as soon as you provide some of that tensile, it'll just crumble. And that's what happens in bank slump. It's the slumping due to a tensile process, so the pulling the material due to gravity and slumping. So having really deep root systems, you can actually get them in down here into that sort of failure plane and it provides that reinforcement. A few years ago, I was well, back 2010 now, I was involved in a project uh, with the Victorian government. There was a parliamentary inquiry in the role of riparian vegetation in both um, flooding and also in stopping erosion. Bit of background, the Victorian government invested quite heavily in revegetating stream systems during the 90s and early 2000s. And then they had, then they had the drought and then they had huge floods in 2010, similar to sort of southeast Queensland. And there was a lot of sort of angst and communities sort of blaming vegetation on flooding or blaming vegetation on erosion. So we had this um, task to go out there and work out what role these revegetation programs had played in limiting or um, stream bank erosion. So what we did, we found a range of paired sites and we used those paired sites to, one had been revegetated say 10 to 15 years ago and one hadn't. But if you go back to the balance, all the other properties were the same. So the only one of the change was that bank resistance factor. They had the same flow, they had the same slope, and they had the same sediment supply going down them. The only difference generally was one landholder had agreed to a vegetation program and one hadn't. So this is Black Range Creek in northeast Victoria. Vegetation program implemented further downstream, one hadn't been. That's what it looked like after the floods, and that's what it uh, looked like after the floods. So where the vegetation program had been implemented, you saw really effective um, stabilisation properties where it hadn't, you saw ongoing stream bank erosion. Similar site on Barwidgee Creek in a similar sort of area. Vegetation program implemented further downstream, no vegetation program implemented and you can see widespread stream bank erosion whereas the upstream reach held up really well to exactly the same flood event. This is probably one of my favourite examples of river restoration in Australia. And it's the Genoa River, um, again in sort of eastern Victoria. And the Genoa River had a major flood in the 1988, I think it was, which took out the Princess's Highway, which is the main uh, highway that joins Sydney and Melbourne on the coast, so not the Hume Highway. $30 million worth of damage that flood event caused because the highway bridge was taken out and had to be replaced. The East Gippsland Catchment Management Authority and the Victorian Government undertook a massive sort of restoration project in the subsequent 10 years, and that's what it looked like in 2011. They actually had a similar size flood event in 2010 to they did in 1988, and I think there was something like $20,000 worth of flood recovery damage compared to 30 million in the 80s. So if you go back to the balance, quite often when you're seeing stream bank erosion issues, they're not necessarily due to something at the local scale. It's something that may have changed in the catchment. And quite often it's changes in flow. Quite often um, first settlers and European, they came here, they removed vegetation because they thought it increased flooding. And that's true. At the local scale, if there's vegetation, you will see more floodplain inundation. But if everyone does that further downstream, you have higher flooding because water travels faster through the reaches and gullies and you end up with flood, higher flood peaks further down. So quite often we're dealing with larger flood events than we're used to for this same given rainfall event. And again, I mentioned bed and bank resistance, so vegetation has sometimes historically been removed. So we're effectively sliding that that way and increasing this. There's also those...
Did I press something? No, I don't know. Sorry about that. And I also gave some really specific examples about how the stream slope's been affected as well. Sometimes channelisation works to make sinuous rivers straight and also sand and gravel extraction have increased that factor as well. So the general tendency of those different combinations of processes is to tip our streams into more of an erosional phase. So we start to see more widespread stream bank erosion than we may have used to. So the key changes are just sort of higher. The increase in flows during flood events due to changes in the catchments. Decrease in bank resistance due to changes in riparian vegetation condition. So as I sort of highlighted, that's a really good example of good Bank resistance. Native vegetation is the most useful and effective material providing that bank resistance. Operates across all scales. So I talked about the, the ground covers providing that sort of armoring effect, the larger trees providing the bank strength, and then also the hydraulic impact of that vegetation and foliage in the branches. It's cheap and has a whole range of associated ecological benefits. However, it takes time to grow. And that's probably the major issue in implementing vegetation programs for stream bank erosion. This is what we like to call the trajectory of change. Up here, you've got rehabilitation effort. So how much money or resources you need to put in to rehabilitate a stream system. And down here, we've got how much resistance that provides over time. So as you can see, you can put in a lot of effort planting vegetation, but you don't get much benefit straight away. It takes time for the vegetation to establish. And after sort of 10, 15 years, you can get really, really good bank resistance out of vegetation establishment programs. However, unfortunately, some of our stream banks look like that. If you go out and plant vegetation along the top of the bank or on the actual bank face, which you probably can't because it's actually too steep, but it's not really, it hasn't got a very high likelihood of succeeding. It's going to, you know, it's going to be erosion of the toe and the vegetation will topple in. So there's two kind of processes that cause this bank to erode. It's the hydraulic forces along the toe of the bank, which cause scour. And hydraulic forces are actually highest along the lower end of the bank and they get less and less as they go up the bank. So they're related to the depth of the flow. So at the bottom of the channel, the forces are higher. At the top of the bank, the forces are lower. And also the gravitational forces, and that's related to how steep the bank is. If you have a really steep vertical bank, it's gonna be much more prone to failure and slumping due to those gravitational forces and the weight of the bank causing that tensile failure I mentioned earlier, compared to the ba a, bank that will, a bank that's sort of gently sloping. Like, nice batter like that. So a range of tools that we use to overcome both those processes. So this is down on the Oxley River in the Tweed River catchment near where I live in northern New South Wales. Really steep vertical bank. That was just after Cyclone Debbie, that previous photo. And with the Tweed Shire Council, we've laid the bank back on a nice batter to one is to three. So for every metre up, three horizontal. That's enabled to um, grass to get established and now some trees have been planted and then we use rock and timber along the toe to protect it's called it's called toe protection so as I mentioned before the highest forces are along that lower toe zone so you protect that against those higher forces and that supports the upper bank for the vegetation to get established over time more locally the O'Connell River which we've done some work with reef catchments on Similar process, steep vertical bank, um, been laid back to a nice stable gradient and then rock used along the toe to protect that really high energy zone. And that's really critical in a lot of these stream systems is to provide that little bit of toe protection which allows the vegetation to get established on the bank. 
you didn't have that toe protection, you laid the bank back like that, so it's a nice stable gradient that's good to revegetating. But unfortunately, over time, it will just get eaten away. Especially on the outside of a bend like this, it will get eaten away and the vegetation will collapse into the channel. That, that wouldn't would slump itself back there from this go and, and revegetate like, through a natural process like that. This one wouldn't? Yeah. Um, that's a good point, and sometimes they can. Yeah, this one particularly wouldn't. It's on the outside of a meander bend. You can see it sort of flowing around like that. Yeah, it's all the forces on the outside of the bank and it's sort of a meander migration process. But then now there's no real trees on the upper bank to provide that resistance over time. So it would keep retreating. But that's a really important point. Not all banks will necessarily continue to erode the way they have. Another tool we like to use, just a bit of a different process to the rock toe protection I just showed you is called pile fields. And here's an example from um, when they were implemented in 1996. They're basically rows of timber piles that you use the excavator to bag into the river channel. And generally they're about 200 to 300 metres in diameter and then you have a gap of a similar sort of magnitude. And what that does, it sort of creates that artificial um, forest effect that I was talking about before is the flow has to travel through the piles uh, has to overcome the piles and create that resistance similar to vegetation would. So it turns what would be a high energy environment, so where the fast flowing water would typically flow along the edge of the bank, it turns it into a low energy environment. And you can start to see seeds and sediment being dropped out in that zone. So all these seeds that have just established here, that was largely a natural process due to the piles slowing down the water enough, starts to drop out sand and seeds that might be coming down in flood events and over time you get colonisation along the lower bank. O'Connell River. So this is down the lower end of the O'Connell River. This bank here um, produced 60,000 cubic metres of sediment between 2010 and 2014. So as a guide, that's... Something like 50 or 60 Olympic swimming pools of sediment has came out of one bank. So we helped Recatchment design a solution which laid the bank back. Again, it was on the outside bend, so we thought this was going to keep happening. Didn't have much vegetation along the top of that bank. Pretty sort of sandy, silty materials. So it didn't have any good bank resistance. So we helped Recatchment design a bit of a solution. Again, with the pile fields. Hopefully I've got a video of it playing here. So what you can see here is the pile slowing the water up against the bank. Typically, as I said before, on the outside bank where the fast flowing water would normally be, and you're seeing the piles actually slowing that water in that near bank zone and pushing the faster water out into the centre of the channel. So you can really sort of see that the, through the piles, the velocity of the water is a lot less than it is out towards the channel of the piles. As you can see, there's been really good grass establishment in around the piles, and just recently, I believe, reef catchments went out there and did a whole lot of planting on that bank as well. Another example of pile fields this is the Oxley River, a similar one to I showed you at the start, and the Tweed River catchment. Devastated after the flood associated with Cyclone Debbie last April. Laid the bank back, put in rows of piles to slow that water down and implement a vegetation program. Budget Creek, this is down in the Gold Coast sort of hinterland area. Again, rapid rates of stream bank erosion working into a council park. Came up with a bit of a different approach here. Um, had some sort of shallowish bedrock here, so driving in piles wasn't going to be an option. So we used um, timber logs and dug them into the channel like this, pointed out the root balls into the channel, and then used some larger rocks to hold those logs down. Again, it's using a similar sort of process, providing that toe protection 
reducing the velocity up against the lower bank and allowing vegetation to establish on that upper surface. So it looked like one year on and two years on. Went out there the other day and I could barely get down to the um, water's edge due to the vegetation establishment on that bank. And the thing about these solutions, so the timber and the pile solutions, they only have a finite life. So we only expect them to stay in the water for about 10 to 15 years before they rot away. But that should be enough time to get the vegetation established on the upper bank which will provide the long-term bank resistance. Take-home messages. So stream processes affect communities in a whole range of ways, whether there's loss of land for farms, um, water supply, environmental, such as the Great Barrier Reef. This is a key one, as the drivers of stream bank erosion can be some distance away from the actual erosion. And quite often you might be standing on the stream bank and you might think, was that log that pushed water here or something here? But quite often they're processes that are occurring at the catchment scale that you have no real impact on and the stream's adjusting to those processes. Restoring riparian vegetation is a critical component of stream restoration. It provides a really cheap and cost-effective way of providing that bank resistance. The range of methods available to help that vegetation establishment. But the two most critical ones are protecting the toe and providing that stable bank angle for the vegetation to establish. So something between a one is to three grade. But yeah, they're the two key ones is protecting the toe from that fast flowing water and laying the bank back to a stable gradient that can get vegetation established. And then also obviously getting the correct advice from groups like reef catchments about what species will actually grow in that environment as well. That's all I really had on that topic today, so can I open it up for any questions? Yeah. Yes. At the very local scale it can, like around the piles it can a little bit, um, and you wouldn't want them, so I'll go back to that. That pile field example there. They don't extend too far out into the channel, so yeah, that's part of the design consideration. If I extended them the whole way across the channel and like really constricted the flow, then definitely that could have an impact. But you might expect a little bit of extra sort of sediment moving on the outside of the pipes, but it wouldn't have enough impact to destabilise the system. It's all part of the sort of consideration and sort of model the velocities and work out how much um, damage it could potentially do and it wouldn't have them extending too far out to the channel. So generally they might only extend like maybe 5% out into the channel and that's not going to have an impact on the other bank or further downstream, it's just going to have an impact at the local scale. But yeah, if you did extend them sort of 50 to 60% out in the channel, then you could have a real impact by constricting that flow and potentially impact the other side. So, yeah. Past 2010, we had a number of dry years, so we didn't have much stream flow. Yeah. Uh, in that time, um, a lot of vegetation grew up yeah. in the stream, in the middle of the stream. Yeah. And what we're seeing now is a lot of Yep. Um, provide resistance on the banks as well. So it does quite happen to happen in droughts. You get a lot of vegetation established in the channel. And if you have nothing, no resistance on the banks, then it will cause some deflection into those banks. But if you have really good resistance on the banks, then the flow will be almost be forced to scour out that vegetation rather than scour out the banks. Yep. Yeah. 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 A lot of times we do a people like reef or they go in and so plant a heap of trees on the inside bank of a creek. Yep. And where's the water going to go? Yep. To the outside. Yeah. And I've seen that in a few years. I think I've said, where you've got a lot of. So keep going, yeah. Yeah, where, where you've got, well, I've seen a few, few incidents there where you've got a lot of erosion on the outside bank. Yep. There's big trees going, going across, and of course that's the water goes around, swirls. Yep. And that sediment goes over there, so the trees are going to keep growing across. Yeah, it's an well, interesting... Um, yeah, it's an interesting question is whether, whether a pool 
it's a push pull process. So quite, quite often erosion on, on the outside of the bank, and that because that's where the faster flowing water would naturally occur. And as it erodes, you then get deposition and vegetation establishment on the inside of the bank. But it's generally, regardless of that vegetation was there, water will always be travelling fast on the outside of the bank because it's gravitational sort of pull and acceleration around the bend. So generally, I don't vegetation or the sediment.